you again for joining us for this post-show discussion. It's very important for us to engage the audience in new ways and find opportunities to expand on the topics within our productions. Again, my name is Leonay Noble. I'm the Director of Equity and Belonging and part of the artistic team here at Shakespeare Theatre Company. So this evening we have with us Professor David Luban, who is at Georgetown University and is a professor of law and philosophy. We also have Shannon Prince, who is the class of 2016 FASB Law Fellow and an associate at Boyce, Schiller, and Flexner. And we are excited, very excited to have moderating this discussion, internationally known director, writer, and the new artistic director at Theater J, Haley Finn. So thank you all and enjoy your discussion. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say to start off, this is an incredible piece of theater and um, I'm still reeling from seeing it. I'm sure all of you are in the same position. Um, one of the things that's most striking to me about this is that it's about history, but it really resonates um, with ethical questions that I think we can all say um, are kind of follow us throughout time and I'm so happy to be in conversation with you around these questions. Um, as we're thinking about the, the topic for tonight is um, ambivalent perpetrator, you know, uh, you know, sort of what would you do in that situation? I think that this play asks that question um, and certainly that moment with the doctor in particular I think encapsulates that question. Um, you see the dilemma there about whether it was better for him to stay and try to do some good in the situation or whether he should leave. And I'm just curious if you could, you know, either of you want to speak to that really difficult question. Am I on? Yeah. Uh, I should just say a word about what, how we met and what we did at FASB. FASB is a, a really unique educational experience for young professionals and for the older people who are leading parts of, uh, parts of the discussion. Uh, because what we are doing is looking at the ethics of our own professions today by looking at what our professions did then. And uh, um, we were both uh, in the law program. Uh, I was one of the co-leaders and Shannon was one of the fellows and that's how we first made each other's acquaintance. Uh, there was one session where we were studying the text by a German lawyer um, named uh, Bernhard Lersner. Uh, Bernhard Lersner was uh, the Jewish specialist in the Interior Ministry. Think of it as the Department of the Interior in the United States. If, I mean, I, let me just stop for a second and say, I'm going to draw analogies. We're both going to draw analogies. We are not making any statements about moral equivalence. Moral equivalence is not on the table. What is on the table is uh, whether the things that get people to do wrong uh, have any equivalence or any analogy. So Bernhard Lersner gets a phone call one night. Um, the Fuhrer has an important speech to make tomorrow, or in three days, to uh, announce a piece of legislation, but it hasn't been drafted yet. Could you fly off to Nuremberg, where he's going to make this uh, presentation? And uh, Lersner packs up his papers, and he goes, and then three all-night drafting sessions, and he has written the Nuremberg Laws. Uh, he stayed in this job. He claimed that his role all along was to make the Nuremberg Laws as lenient as possible against the party radicals. So his job was to, or his, his contribution was, I'm going to make them apply to as few people as possible. Now the Nuremberg Laws uh, strip Jews of citizenship uh, and institute a realm of persecution, a kind of uh, you know, you might think of it as super Jim Crow persecution. Uh, and he wants them to apply to as few people as possible. He claims that he saved 20,000 lives. Uh, and two things struck me about that. First was that saving 20,000 lives is something that's more than any of us, I expect, will ever do. Um, 
The second was that I could imagine my own law students, I'm a law teacher, uh, going to work in the government and getting a call saying the national leader wants you to come for three exciting all night drafting sessions and you're going to be doing something really important and they would have seen this as one of the most, uh, the high points of their career. Uh, so that, that, was, that was what obsessed me. And the question was, how do you know when you ought to stop doing this? And should he have stopped doing it? The question that you're asking. And that was what I was mulling on ever since. So I don't know, what, what was your reaction, Shannon? Well, David wrote a piece on Bernard Lisner for Georgetown Journal of Legal Ethics, to which I was invited to publish a piece in response. And in that piece, I asked readers to think about the situation of this minority population that has been demonized, that has been relocated to a place where they are in desperate conditions and starving, and about this population deciding that they are going to engage in an armed uprising. And when this armed uprising is inevitably put down, the survivors are either sent to a concentration camp or put to death. Now, as some of you may recognize, I am talking about Jews under Fuhrer Hitler in the Warsaw Ghetto. But I'm also talking about Dakota Native Americans on Minnesota reservation land under President Lincoln. So we think about people who were part of the regime of Hitler as perpetrators. Well, what about people who were in the administration of Lincoln? What about someone who was in the administration because they were an abolitionist? Is that a perpetrator too? So in my own piece, a good and virtuous nature may recoil on consorting with evil to do good. I set out three criteria for which ethical people can participate in unethical regimes. The first one is if the good that you seek to do is urgent enough. So one reason Bernard Lusner joined the Nazi party, he claimed after the fact, was not because of anti-Semitism. He says it was despite anti-Semitism, but that he wanted to address problems such as unemployment. Now, I don't think that's a good reason to become a Nazi. But I would argue, going back to the example of Lincoln, that joining his regime to try and stop slavery would be a sufficient reason. The second criteria is if one's moral clarity won't become so confounded that one comes to confuse mitigating evil with committing and affirmatively committing a limited amount of it. So what I mean by that is after the Dakota uprising, sham trials were held and 303 Dakota were sentenced to death. Lincoln lowered that number to 38, which still makes it the largest mass execution in US history. He saved 265 lives. But because he could have saved all of them and didn't, in that context, I don't see him as a mitigator, but a perpetrator. And the final criteria is self-explanatory. I think it's possible for an ethical actor to participate in an unethical regime if they don't participate in both the bad and good acts of the regime in the belief that the latter balance out the former. Um, thank you for that. Yeah, it certainly is kind of the question of are you sort of better off infiltrating and being part of the regime and working within it to, to do some good, as you're saying, or, to, you know, are you better off kind of acting without it, I think were some of the questions that, um, that you're raising here. I also really appreciate that um, you've taken this play and brought it into other time periods and other ethical questions that we are certainly facing and have faced even here in this country. Um, I would love to know, as you were watching the play this evening, were there any things in particular, any like moral questions that really resonated heavily that made you think about some of the work that you're currently doing? Well, it, what it made me think about was uh, work that I did do for many years, which was, uh, uh, I, I teach legal ethics um, at Georgetown Law School. I also teach international criminal law, and these are subjects that come into a kind of eerie convergence uh, when we see, well, here it was the role of the physicians, but uh, the lawyers as well, the ones who were writing the business contracts between the businesses in Buna uh, that were using slave labor, uh, specifying how many calories a day they were required to uh, provide and uh, uh, 
who pays for the food. Uh, there were lawyers just sitting there drafting that, drafting the regulations. The, the work that I was doing, was, I, I got a real shock um, in 2004 when uh, the first torture memos uh, were released showing how high-level U.S. government lawyers were writing legal excuses for the torture program. Uh, and I, I know a lot of wonderfully you know, good and honorable uh, Justice Department lawyers, uh, including some who worked in that office. But this was something that, uh, uh, I said, how, how do you do that? How can you do that? Now, they had, some of them, a strong belief that it was necessary for national security. What about those who didn't, who thought that they were going to be the next Bernhard Lerzner? And uh, let's see if I can mitigate this by putting in this right footnote that will limit the number of people that this treatment can be, uh, can be applied to. Uh, so that was, that was something that resonated with me a lot. Uh, there was, uh, you know, I think another point when I um, got a, an email, this was a, a few years ago, from a, a young government worker who had read something that I had written, who said, uh, I've just been asked to uh, write a new regulation, uh, and the effect of the new regulation that I'm being asked to write is going to uh, uh, harm hundreds of thousands of poor people in the United States. Should I quit my job? Uh, and we did some back and forth about that. And I thought, well, what, what do you do? Uh, and I, I think your criteria make a lot of sense. I'd like to add some other criteria about when you can stay and when you can't. Uh, the, the first is that uh, uh, when I've studied the, those Nazi lawyers who actually did resist, I'm not sure to what extent Bernhard Lerzner was one of them. I think he, I think he was telling the truth, but the, you know, this is a post-war whitewash in part. Uh, they always had allies in the office. There were people that were protecting them. There were people that would wink at them and uh, allowed them enough wiggle room uh, to, uh, to actually make a difference. And it became clear that if you don't have the allies, that you're not going to have any maneuvering room and you're simply selling yourself a bill of goods when you say, I'm staying on this job because I'm going to do some good because you won't be able to do any good. Uh, so that's the second piece is having that kind of maneuvering room that you can actually do it. No maneuvering room, then it's time to get out. Now, why don't people get out? There was a, a very powerful piece that was written in the wake of the Vietnam War by a man named James Thompson who had uh, two very important historical roles. One was that he helped write the Tonkin Gulf uh, resolution that started the war. The other was that he was the first US official to resign in protest of the war. And he asked this question, why did I stay on so long? And he talked about something called the effectiveness trap. The effectiveness trap is that if I'm in a bureaucratic position, I can actually make a difference. I can make a difference here. If I speak up and protest, then I'll be shut out of the loop. I'll lose my effectiveness, which is the only thing that I have going for me. So the effectiveness trap, Thompson said, is what stops people from speaking out. It's what stops people from resigning. Now, I, I was thinking about this when I was reading your book. Shannon has uh, written a, a book last year called uh, Tactics of Racial Justice, in which uh, part of <clears throat> Part of the, the mission of it is uh, how do you talk about, how do you have these difficult conversations with other people and in the workplace? How do you get yourself to speak out in a way that actually makes a difference and doesn't simply close everybody up? Maybe you could speak a little bit about that. 
<laughs> sure. So the, one of the themes of my book is that when you are in profoundly compromised situations and you're trying to make change, what you need is skills and not feels. So it's not about feeling the right things and holding the right beliefs. That's a necessary prerequisite. But it's about knowing strategies and having practiced them that are demonstrated at making persuasive change. And I think that's because we have to go back to the notion of Hannah Arendt of the banality of evil, which we saw so beautifully illustrated in the play. And the reason evil is so banal is, as Mary Wollstonecraft once said, no man chooses evil because it is evil. He only mistakes it for happiness, for the good that he seeks. Evil people are no different from the rest of us in the sense that they are doing what all of us do. They are seeking the good as we see, they see it. And if we're going to change them, we have to reach out to them from that perspective because if we treat them like deliberate villains, we won't get anywhere. So that means that when you're in conversation with someone whose views or whose actions you find egregious, you need to try and fairly and accurately characterize their stance to acknowledge their perspective before you begin to address it because that both earns you rhetorical capital and it ensures that you're addressing their actual belief and not a caricature of it. It means that we prep for those conversations by using techniques such as those described by Harvard lecturer Holly Weeks, such as thinking about what happens when you get your buttons pushed in a conversation so that you can plan to have less antagonizing reactions. It means that you write a script for what you're going to say before you say it. The first draft is in politic as you want, and then that next draft more refined. It means that you practice what you're going to say with a friend so that your demeanor automatically becomes less aggressive. And then you have that friend point out your body language so that you don't get undermined by your nonverbal communication. Ultimately, you can't change someone and demonize them at the same time. People are very rarely bludgeoned into change. They have to be wooed into it. That's very good and practical advice. Um, I, I just think that this is uh, such an interesting conversation here, and one of the things I don't know that I've stuck with in this play is the fact of the responsibility and how everyone had a small part, and the small parts really add up. Um, and as you said, no one saw themselves as as evil. No one was out there to try to be evil, but they were thinking that they were trying to find their happiness. Obviously, completely misguided. Um, we do have some time for some questions, and I would love to um, get some questions if people have it in the audience. I know we don't have a microphone, so if you wouldn't mind speaking up, and I will uh, repeat the question so that it can be heard by everybody. Does anyone have a question? Uh, yes. Great question. So the question on the table is, what happened to those people who refused to participate in the Nazi regime? Well, the, they had the power to resign. But uh, I think that part of the question is, uh, what would have happened at Auschwitz if he had left? Uh, worse things would have happened. That was the, that was the reason that he stayed. Uh, I want to go back to, I, I'm, I, he was a lone doctor. Did he save 93,000 people? Not alone. So I want to go back to the point that he must have had allies or fellow travelers, those who were covering for him, uh, those, those who thought, well, he's not just an eccentric who's saving these completely dispensable human beings. And, um, and he obviously had some room to operate. Uh, you know, I was, a moment that really struck me in the play was when his son said, I would have stood there and then I would have thrown myself in front of the tracks. Uh, that wouldn't have saved nearly as many lives. It would have maintained a kind of moral purity. It might have been something that a person would do in order to shock their fellows into looking at themselves in the mirror 
in a different way. But you can't be confident of that. They might have just thought, well, this was, this was another case of uh, battle fatigue. I mean, what we, what we do know is that the SS had uh, a, a mental hospital for SS officers who broke down because of what they were doing. And you know, so it, 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 I think from a consequential point of view, uh, he made a right choice. Maybe, uh, from a personal point of view, and from the point of view of the son, all the all the evil that he did greatly outweighed the good that he did. But I think that one of your criteria that I was picking up on was maybe that you don't make these decisions by a pure consequential balance. Right, and I think too that there's a flip side to that question, which is what happened to the doctors who did not resist, that did not try to do any good, that we might think of as more purely evil. And I think it's interesting to look at that question from the perspective of Germany's two genocides. So in the play, Mengele was mentioned, and he was this horrific Nazi doctor, but where did Mengele come from? What sort of professional ethical training did he get? Well, the first genocide of the 20th century was Germany's genocide of East Africans in its colonies. This is a genocide that they've never paid reparations for, that they barely even memorialize. And one of the doctors who did medical experiments on the people in concentration camps during that genocide went on to live his life because there were no Nuremberg trials after that genocide, there was no reckoning, and he became a medical professor. And one of the students he taught was Mengele. And so I think that we need to talk about, you know, what would have happened to the people who desisted, but also what happened to the people who didn't and how different it was for these doctors who, if they didn't escape, met a reckoning, and those doctors who got no reckoning, and because they didn't, they created Mengele's. Right, yes, you know, who, who are you taught by is certainly a part of this equation. Um, any other questions in the audience? Uh, yes. When we live and think about ethics, we are living in an environment, the society has created that we're living in. Ethics is a slippery slope. It's not an absolute. And I think clearly the, uh, what we saw in the play uh, describes moving down that slippery slope to a very great degree. But I think in the United States, we are living on a slippery slope. Oh, okay, great. We're talking about um, the slippery slope of ethics um, and in this country. Would, would either of you like to address um, ethical questions in this country at this moment? Well, uh, I, I didn't know we had any. Right? Yeah, it's, a, yeah, uh, it's a very open-ended question, so <laughs> however you want to take it. You know, well, I mean, slippery... The slippery slope, so let, let, let me say something about the slippery slope that we saw in the play. Uh, at the end, uh, one of the characters says, a genocide is, begins with words. Okay. And uh, uh, it would be important, therefore, to look at the words that are being spoken. Uh, there have been many you know, historians and social psychologist studies about the kind of words that are incitements to genocide. And uh, um, they always involve dehumanizing the potential victims. They always involve seeing the victims as an incredible threat to us. So there is uh, an othering. There's them and there's us and they want to destroy us. Uh, if they want to replace us. This is the great replacement theory that we see taking place. Uh, I mean, I think it began in France, but this is the rhetoric of um, some of the alt-right now. Uh, and that allows you to recast murderousness as self-defense. So I think that one of the things that is, uh, that is such an incredible social, psychological, philosophical and moral problem for us is uh, uh, it, it's not that these people's ethics turned upside down. Did they stop believing thou shalt not murder? Well, they might not have 
stop. I mean, they might have continued to believe thou shalt not murder, but we know that for most people, except for absolute pacifists, um, there's an exception to thou shalt not kill, and that is when you're defending yourself, when you're defending your people. So if you can recast, the, if you can first other these other people, and then say they are an existential threat to us, then suddenly you haven't changed your ethics. What's really happened is that you've changed your, your view. You've adopted, in this case, it was this kind of a series of conspiracy theories, crackpots, eugenics in the air, many different strands. But the main thing was that uh, uh, the, the reversal of ethics is built first on the loss of common sense and uh, falling into crack pottery and elevating crack pottery to a national leadership position. And I, I won't say anything, <laughs> I won't say anything more. Uh, this, uh, no politics. <laughs> uh, would you like to add to that, Shannon? I think that if we don't want to fall down these slippery slopes, that it's essential that we start having uncomfortable conversations about perpetration. I think that's the only way that we can recognize the potential or even the, the reality of immorality in each other, in ourselves, in people whose views we find egregious, and in people with whom we feel affinity. I think so much of our current cultural war about how children are to be educated is about how we reckon with or whether we reckon with the perpetrators in our past and in our present. It's about whether we teach children that Thomas Jefferson was a founding father, the serial rapist of a sex slave, or both. And I think that what this play shows us, what FASB teaches us with the example of Lincoln and the Dakota teaches us, is that perpetrators are sometimes ordinary people. Perpetrators are sometimes enlightened professionals. Perpetrators in a different context are sometimes illustrious heroes. But none of that, not ordinariness, not professionalism, not even heroism necessarily keeps somebody from being a perpetrator. So if we don't want to fall down that slope into perpetration, the only thing that can stop it is if we train ourselves to be ethical actors and are willing to engage in those conversations. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes. For justifying torture, no, as far as I know. Um, I think that some of the people have been promoted. Uh, any other? Um, let me just add one. So there were 101 cases that were referred to a special prosecutor for investigation of people who went beyond what the torture allegedly, I speak like a law professor, allegedly went beyond what the torture memos uh, uh, permitted, and they were very permissive. Uh, none of them were prosecuted. Thank you. Uh, there's a question over here. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a series of little permissions, I think, is, is what uh, lands a person in this position where, where all, of, you, all of a sudden, if you do a self-reflective check, you are in a position of evil. What kind of internal litmus checks can a person do uh, on the progression, on the road to that, to that eventual, eventual destination to avoid it? Okay, great. Um, so the question here is, um, often it's a bunch of little things that sort of add up to your, um, to your getting on the path of evil. And are there any sort of litmus tests that you can give yourself along the way to sort of uh, self-check? It seems, Shannon, you had a, some ideas about that earlier. Is there anything else you would like to add to that? So I think it's interesting that we phrase it as a self-check, and I think coming back to what you say about having allies, that it's important to go beyond yourself, because as the Bible says, the heart is deceitful above all things. You can do that self-check and say, yay, I passed it, and keep making that salary and stay <laughs> evil. I think that you need people who are peers and also people who are mentors that you can ask these questions of. I think it's important to have people outside of your field where evil things may be normalized, and there are other people who have a fresh perspective that you can hold these conversations with. I think, too, that it's important that we uh, don't get 
confined into ideological bubbles. I think you need people in your life who are outside your faith community or outside your race, vote differently than you, and that you talk to those people too and get their perspectives so that you're not just confirming your own biases. And I think that when you do those things, you're less likely to make those little decisions because you've put some buffers around yourself. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, there's a question over here. Uh, professor, Tell us what the young regulator decided to do. The one who was crafting the regulation that was going to harm hundreds of thousands of poor people. What did he do or she do? Um, they wouldn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you know, it, that's, uh, it was a very, it was, this was all done by email. And I should say, I didn't give advice. I just no. laid out a set of about a dozen questions to ask yourself. And they said, thank you. Uh, uh, and I don't think I want to tell you what I've decided to do. Mm, very interesting. Um, so uh, uh, we were just talking about um, what um, was said earlier about kind of a rubric. Uh, and do you want to, to summarize a little bit? I think there was a question about what that question was referring to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I've always thought that one thing that one does if you start a new job is to uh, think about what the pitfalls are at the beginning and figure out at the beginning, uh, well, what are the, what's the red line for me? Maybe write it down, put it in a drawer. Uh, I read a memoir once by a, a, a former prosecutor who said that when he started his job as a prosecutor, he did that. Um, the, uh, um, his red line was, I'm not going to ever prosecute somebody when I'm not convinced they did it. Uh, he went ahead and did that at one point. A few months later, it finally caught up with him and he quit. Now, I'm not saying this was the right red line. I mean, I think it was, but uh, um, you could disagree about that. But uh, the fact that he, that he had uh, recognized that when you're in the job, your own judgment might get corrupted because uh, practices seem normalized. Uh, oh, I didn't know that we're allowed to backdate documents. Well, it's just the way that we do this around here. And it, you know, it's, it's such, such a small thing that we've backdated this document. Uh, oh, okay, well, I guess that's the way that it's done around here. All the people that I look at, who I look up to and respect, they all seem to be fine with it. So that's where, that's where you know, figuring out your own self beforehand is really important. I think that's both great advice, figuring out your own self, and then also, Shannon said, maybe getting people outside of your bubble outside. community to, be, um, to help uh, check you on some of your assumptions. Um, I think we have time for one more question. If there's one, oh, yes, back here. Great. So the question is, is it, um, are we justified to make sort of uh, assumptions or um, opinions about actions in the past and have an ethical opinion about them? What, what do you think? Do you want to start or mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think that uh, not only are we entitled to judge, we have to judge. If we, if we don't judge, then we have no bearings for ourselves. Now, I mean, I think this is a, a complicated question. I don't want to judge morals back in the Stone Age. Um, people back in the Stone Age might have done things that I think are, uh, are completely immoral, but that's so distant that uh, um, I don't feel like I could say, well, you know, they just, uh, they just violated the golden rule. I mean, they barely, they only learned language last week. Uh, <laughs> You know, they, it takes a while to formulate the golden rule. Uh, one of the things that I think makes the play that we just saw so shocking is that these are not people from an alien world. Um, these are people that are five degrees, 10 degrees, maybe just one degree different from us. Uh, and yet, what happened in 1933 was that uh, uh, what had been a conventional morality of decency, 
put it, uh, very swiftly changes to a morality of indecency. And a, a, a philosopher who I, I read a lot, Hannah Arendt, said that uh, for her, one of the things that uh, was even more upsetting was seeing how swiftly it just changed back afterwards because it was more upsetting because it made her think that maybe morality is just made out of a rope of sand. Uh, so when she heard the, uh, the, uh, the claim that you can't judge if you haven't been there, she said, no, the only way that we can be responsible is by being willing to sit in judgment, knowing that our judgment is fallible and knowing that as a judge, we can ourselves be judged. Is there anything you want to add, Shannon? So there's a legal principle that one cannot be convicted for a law that was not in effect during the time of the crime. And in Nuremberg, the defense actually made that argument that the things that these people did were legal, so what are we convicting them for? And the counter argument was that the laws they violated are essentially natural laws, they're universal laws. These things are wrong or right across time and space. And I think that's true. We often excuse people's behavior by saying that they were a product of their time. But the people who hid Anne Frank were of the same time as these people enjoying their leisure that we saw in the play. The people who ran the Underground Railroad were of the same time as the people who owned the slaves. So across time, right and wrong have been consistent. They may have been expressed in different ways, but they remain universal norms. And I agree with David that not only is it permissible for us to judge other times and places, it's imperative. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Shannon. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. Um, And I also just want to take a moment again to thank the artists who uh, made this play because it really does raise these ethical questions that are so important and so universal. So I just want to take a moment to thank them as well. And so thank you for being here tonight and have a wonderful evening. <laughs>